Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon is capital E essential viewing for film fans and has long been the gold standard for questioning the subjective nature of truth. Based on the 1922 short story In a Grove by Ryunosuke Akutagawa, Rashomon takes the general premise, conflicting accounts surrounding the death of a samurai in a bamboo forest, but adds a cinematic layer to the lean seven chapters worth of collected testimony. The film and the so-called Rashomon effect has become an often imitated format for when one version of events just isn't enough, and we are not so special as to be immune to it. So, let's Rashomon this entire episode, shall we? Yeah, great idea. I'm into it. Hands down the most film up, nerdy yeah. thing I've ever done. We're super into it. Without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers for either this 100-year-old short story or 70-year-old cinematic staple, I'm Clint Gage. I'm Casey Redman. I'm Alex Stedman. I'm Siddhanta Dlaka. And all four of us have our version of the truth at the ready so we can answer the question, What's, what's the, the difference? difference? Yeah, what is the difference? Yeah, it's good enough. As has always been the mission for us here on this show, we love to highlight the difference in the experience of reading a book versus the experience of watching a movie. They are two very different art forms, and an adaptation often has to be more clever than just a straight retelling, and Rashomon might just be the best example of that we've encountered to date. For instance, the production techniques employed by Kurosawa to adapt each testimony are the most fascinating thing about it. No, no, the biggest difference in the experience was the portrayal of the assault. Oh, really? Because I thought it was specifically the performances. Wait, no one else thought it was a rhetorical mirror held up to the reader in the short story, but way fewer opportunities for projecting emotions in the movie? Well, sure. Yeah, of course, there that was some was of part that. Of it. <laughs> yeah, this was a great idea. Like any film based on a short story, writers need to add a lot to fill up a feature-length runtime. In a Grove, with a mere 3,000 words or so, is a collection of transcribed testimonies recounting different perspectives on the murder of a samurai. A woodcutter, a Buddhist priest, a policeman, an old woman, the notorious bandit Tajimaru, the samurai's wife, and the ghost of the samurai himself speaking through a medium all tell their version of the story. There's no context for where the testimonies take place or any other detail beyond who they are and the story they tell. It's literally just a report. The film adheres to that structure for the most part, only adding a framing device of the priest and woodcutter telling their story about that story to a commoner who just wants to hear an interesting story while he stays out of the rain. The lone chapter from the short story that actually gets cut is the old woman's testimony. She is the mother of Masago, the samurai's wife. In the short story, her testimony gives context to the victimized couple, something that's not as necessary to the film version when you can actually see them on screen. But what's fascinating about the adaptation is how Kurosawa actually made it the same. Throughout the film, he employs long lens tracking shots through the branches, obscuring the full details of the events. Even during the testimonies, Kurosawa opts not to feature on screen the high police commissioner conducting the interviews. The witnesses frequently answer questions we in the audience don't hear as they do in the text of In a Grove. The effect is the cinematic equivalent of a transcription. The film also frames the priest and the woodcutter in the background of the current testimony. Of course, they'd still be there, but the implication is to remind us to layer the testimonies on top of each other, just as you keep in mind the previous chapter when reading the next. And while I won't go through the entire film's worth of incredible camera work, which you should do on your own, I have to focus on one shot as the best example of adaptation by camera maybe ever. In the short story, Masago tells her tale of being assaulted by the bandit Tajimaru, and after seeing a look in her husband's eyes that literally made her faint, she decides to kill him along with herself as opposed to either of them continuing to live in shame. All of this, of course, is in the text of Masago's testimony. In the film, though, as Masako is telling her version of the story, we see her pleading with her husband not to look at her with such a cold loathing. She moves back and forth, uncomfortable under the cruel gaze, but no matter where she goes, the camera moves with her, changing the perspective so that she never finds herself with more space in the frame. Her husband's shoulder is dominating the shot, trapping her in a small space on the right side of the frame. Next, Kurosawa cuts to a pair of tight close-ups in which the wife cries face down into the ground. It's not until this wide shot, with the dagger featuring prominently in the foreground, that her character actually has space to maneuver. It's the moment that she's thought of a way out that the camera finally relents. It's a visual sequence on film that conveys the feeling of an entire testimony in the short story. Watching the movie immediately after reading the short story, you can see moments like this throughout the film. That's certainly not untrue. The film is an incredible visual representation of the story. It is, right? 
But I think the biggest difference between watching the film and reading the story might not be the camera work in that scene, but what actually happens before the scene you described. I first saw Rashomon on a Kurosawa Akira kick some 15 years ago, but fittingly I didn't remember much until I watched it a second time. And a third. It was playing on the big screen at New York's Film Forum Theatre, and I wasn't going to miss that chance, even if it meant showing up after a long day of work. Unfortunately, I did miss parts of the movie because I was in and out of sleep the whole time. Oh, come on, man. I know, I know. It was a dark room, the AC in the blistering summer, and Kurosawa's calming use of nature were too much to resist. I won't apologize. If it were a louder and pacier movie, I would have probably stayed awake, but sometimes your body just gives out and your mind temporarily goes with it. Especially when the story is so moody, so meticulous, and so focused on the natural environment, like a traditional haiku. I wouldn't trade that for the world. But for what I did see at the film forum, I felt like I was falling into the screen, especially when cinematographer Miyagawa Kazuo made use of his telephoto lenses to carve an almost circular backdrop amongst the trees, like the characters were being sucked into a black hole of perspective and circumstance, and I was being sucked in with them. But when I went back to stream Rashomon the next day, something interesting happened. I found myself filling holes in my memory from the previous night, and correcting things I had either dreamt or misinterpreted. I retained only vague flashes of the film during my half-asleep viewing, but what I did remember, clear as day, is the wife's hand coming up to grab the bandit's shoulder when he kisses her. It's a striking image because in a story told from the bandit's point of view, it says one very specific thing. She wanted it. <laughs> when talking about the movie today, or about the Rashomon effect, a lot of people seem to omit or forget the bandit forcing himself on the wife. I don't entirely blame them. During that 15 year gap, I had forgotten about it too, because unlike the contrasting perspectives on the killing and its numerous depictions, the assault is only seen once and it isn't what the trial is about, even though it's very much what the movie is about. But in the more complicated moments of Rashomon, what perspective is even being told can morph and overlap. Take for instance, this moment in the bandit's narration, where the camera swings around over the wife's shoulder and into her close up. It's as if the bandit begins narrating things from her point of view. Kind of like how you're swinging back to my whole thing about the visual adaptation of the story in your confession? Yeah, I guess exactly like that. But the point is, in the bandit's version of the story, he's trying to convince the judges, and us, of her perspective as well. He boasts about sleeping with her, followed by this image that seems to imply some kind of consent. But something I didn't realize until watching it a third time, completely awake the way Kurosawa intended, is that no one else's testimony even touches upon her assault, no matter how differently they tell the story or who's claiming to have committed the murder. As the bandit tells it, he succeeded in making her his, leading to his skirmish with the samurai. As the wife tells it, it caused her husband to view her with contempt, and she even blacked out shortly afterwards. According to the husband's spirit, if you take the medium at her word, his wife was so overcome by ecstasy and attraction that she asked the bandit to kill the samurai. And according to the woodcutter, the bandit begged her to marry him. No matter what outcome is true, every narrative seems to agree on one thing, whether or not they phrase it the same way. This is what transpired between the bandit and the samurai's wife. Sure, to some characters she was a willing participant, but their encounter is practically the only event in the film that's treated as a given from one story to the next. It's what drives the plot each and every time, whether the men are at their most virtuous or at their most cowardly. The bandit practically admits to assaulting her, but in a society where the prevailing perspective is... It doesn't seem to matter. Almost every narrator treats the wife's assault with the same factual mundaneness as the bandit being discovered on the shore side, even though this event seems to inform every character's actions in each version of the story. And I would argue that's another similarity between the short story and the movie. Yeah, both the samurai and his wife begin their testimonies in the short story with quick and pretty flippant acknowledgement that the bandit, Tajamaru, forced himself on Masago. So if we're talking about how reading the story and watching the movie are different experiences, with so many textual similarities, you gotta look at the performances. Rashomon, of course, starts with utter befuddlement. A priest and a woodcutter, hiding from the rain, attempting to understand a story that we don't know about. It's an intriguing setup, one that gives us an idea of what we're in for. A story that, according to these two men, doesn't make a lick of sense. Spirani. From there, we know what we should be doing, looking for the many disparities, or at the very least, oddities, that will eventually crop up. 
It's certainly an approach that grants us a little more hand-holding. In a Grove, however, does none of this. We're plopped right in the middle of a trial for a case that mostly seems, well, just kind of sad at first. A samurai dead, a woman missing, and a bandit who unabashedly takes credit for the crime. Of course, we quickly learn that it's not so straightforward, but that only reveals itself as the various players tell their stories. And while those accounts play out in largely the same way between the short story and the movie, it's the performances in Rashomon that end up painting the starkest differences in terms of how each work feels. The most prominent example of this is the infamous bandit Tajimaru. While his motivation largely remains the same from page to screen, it's Toshiro Mifune's crazed performance that makes Tajimaru feel wildly more unhinged. In the story, Tajimaru speaks plainly. His actions and changing motivations remain pretty chaotic, but he lays them out in a straightforward way. In the movie, on the other hand, we get to see Mifune's insane laughter and his shouts when he's bound. Sure, his actions aren't much different, but the way he recounts them to us is. In this way, Rashomon paints a picture of a much more unpredictable lunatic of a villain. Similar notes could be made about the late samurai's account of the story, told in both versions through a medium. Interestingly, his words remain largely the same. He feels utterly betrayed by his wife and recounts the story with that same heartbroken emotion. But there's a lot to be said for the way Kurosawa frames that medium scene, one of the most exciting in the movie. In the story, it's not even described how the medium reaches out to the samurai. But in Rashomon, we could see her writhe in the sand and struggle with his pain. It's undoubtedly more effective, as is Masayuki Mori's icy portrayal of that cold look that his wife described in In a Grove. Also, in the short story, that cold look comes when the samurai's mouth is crammed full of leaves, because in addition to tying him to a tree, the bandit gags him with leaves and dirt to keep him from speaking. And Masago admits that her husband was trying to speak but couldn't because of the leaves. But it was the look on his face that convinced her of what he was trying to say. Which leaves the door open for a misinterpretation. And that's my point. Kurosawa made choices in the film, like the cruel portrayal of the samurai in that moment, to make some of the motives clearer. Or at least that all the witnesses are more certain about their version of the story. But take the samurai's wife too. There's something about seeing Mashiko Kyo go from the ferocious fighter that Tajimaro described in his testimony to the pathetic, weeping woman that we see at the trial in Rashomon. Since In a Grove is, as previously mentioned, basically just a transcription of trial testimonies, the emotion, or in other words, Kyo's desperate wails, are lost there. In particular, the samurai's wife's actions and overall temperament are the ones that vary the most from account to account in both versions, so it certainly has a different impact to see it portrayed through Kyo's excellent performance. <laughs> Aside from those performances, the biggest difference, of course, is where both stories end. Whereas In a Grove leaves us with a mystery, concluding on the samurai story, Rashomon has the woodcutter recount a more objective telling of what he witnessed. This is, again, an approach that gives us a lot more hand-holding, but it also paints the samurai's story in a very different light. In the short story, the samurai's account is arguably the most plausible, if only because a dead man has the least reason to lie. Not that it's ever made clear to us that that is the actual truth, leaving it up to us to figure it out. Rashomon, however, sets up his story by reminding us that a dead man still has plenty of reason to lie, preserving his honor from beyond the grave, before giving us the woodcutter's account. It goes on to hammer that point even further. None of the parties wanted to share the true story because, well, it was mostly just kind of pathetic on all fronts. <laughs> but that approach too, in addition to the epilogue Rashomon adds, basically changes the takeaway on both versions of the story. The message of In a Grove is a more vague, overarching statement on the changing, unreliable nature of truth, leaving a lot more for us to interpret. Rashomon focuses much more on the why of lies. Basically, humans are self-serving to the point of denying the truth of themselves. This is projected pretty heavy-handedly to us in the epilogue, where we see the priest's faith in humanity shaken, then restored as the woodcutter offers to take care of the baby they found. <laughs> Is Rashomon's comparatively much more tidy ending more satisfying? Maybe. But it also comes across as expecting less introspection from its audience, underestimating our own ability to decipher its meaning. In a Grove does us no such favors, leaving it all open to our interpretation. And in a lot of ways, that's a more effective way of portraying that unreliable nature of truth. In the end, it's all about the truth we choose. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that's almost as if the biggest difference between the story and the movie is your ability to project your own interpretations. Yeah, I don't completely disagree with that. Oh, great, because reading the story took me on a wildly different journey than the movie did for that exact reason. 
I found Kurosawa's choices in the adaptation to be profound. The fact that we begin in this tragic setting of rain and rubble with three characters who frame the story felt ripped right out of a stage production. But more than that sets up what the main difference was for me, the extent to which I could project my own emotions onto the characters. The commoner, for example, seemed at first glance like a vehicle for the audience, stumbling upon two men who had already experienced the harrowing tale. Like the commoner, I wanted to know what they could have heard to produce such anguish. Then again, I may have simply related to the commoner's cynicism, like, look around, dude, this is an unfeeling world where dogs eat dogs and cats are assholes. Either way, the characters at the Rashomon Gate serve two functions, to propel the story and to provide a buffer for your own feelings. In a Grove, meanwhile, immediately put me in a problem-solving state of mind with its first chapter, the testimony of a woodcutter questioned by a high police commissioner. I immediately engaged my logical thinking, as if playing out a whodunit where the characters of the story provided hints to the murderer. From the woodcutter, I was able to log measurable facts about the crime scene. Ah, yes, the game is afoot. And what's more, the story doesn't even give you the perspective of the commissioner to temper your interpretation. For me, the effect of the silent commissioner changed with the visual medium. I no longer felt like I had the task of solving the crime, instead I felt more like a player in the troupe, interacting with others on stage. I felt woven into the fabric of the story, if only as a passive character. This was not only due to Kurosawa's masterful filmmaking, but to the medium itself. I'm much quicker to accept events portrayed on the screen as truth because I can see it with my own eyes. There's less room for my mind to ruminate on a moment, and the only information available to me is what the filmmaker is allowing me to experience. It's like being presented with a tank full of saltwater creatures versus being asked to imagine the ocean. Wow, it's so big. Meanwhile, back with a version of myself who's reading the short story, as the Buddhist priest provided a timeline and other details about the victims, my confidence in solving the case grew. Then he hit me with this sentence. Truly, human life is as evanescent as the morning dew or a flash of lightning. It was the first sign that the tether of measurable truth was loosening. Soon, I feared, I would be grasping at a fog. As the facts gave way to more subjective-driven accounts from these three main characters, I stopped looking for a puzzle. Where once my mind was busy cobbling together the events that transpired in the grove, I suddenly found myself in an emotional state, driven by the point of view of whichever witness I was reading. Masago describes her assault as forcing me to yield to him which effectively produced the most horrifying scene in my mind. So I was surprised when she looked into the eyes of her husband and saw anger, shame, hatred even. The description of this flash in his eyes evoked images of a mirror, as if blinding me with a truth I don't wish to see. As Tajimaro projected his own veracity into the description of Masago, this moment felt like Masago was projecting her own shame and anguish onto her husband. But in the film, I too see the resentment in her husband's expression, and I don't question the reality of it. I hate to be the one to keep bringing up the leaves in the samurai's mouth, but it is proving to be an interesting little change made by Kurosawa. Maybe because the samurai couldn't speak but was trying to? The point of the leaves was precisely what Casey's getting at here. To drive home that she was projecting her feelings onto her husband while he was trying to communicate his own. Whereas in the film, we see him coldly choosing not to speak. Yeah, probably. But again, the biggest difference in reading the story and watching the movie is how we're able to project our feelings onto the events as they unfold. Reading In a Grove, I felt confronted with my own actions, self-destructive or otherwise. I'm no stranger to shame, so I had to ask myself how many times have I projected that anger and resentment onto others? In the film, I found it more difficult to watch her turn on herself with what is potentially a false reality, because I had removed my own introspection from the experience. To see what she goes through in a visual medium and to witness that look from her husband and to see her own anger reflected back at her, I found that unbearable. I was, however, relieved to see Kurosawa's additional scenes with the priest, the woodcutter, and the commoner. In the same way I was left pondering at the end of the short story, these three were left to ponder as well, when they were confronted by a moral quandary. When the commoner selfishly robbed an abandoned child, my cynicism reared its head again, balking at the sliver of hope dangling precariously from the priest's heart. My heart began to sink as well, but thankfully the feeling was short-lived as Kurosawa generously provides a final note of optimism in the woodcutter who took the child as his own. The scene was not without schmaltz, nor was it unearned. It was perfectly balanced. In the end, for me, the short story presents a thought exercise in the subjective truth that resonates on both an intellectual and emotional level. Kurosawa's Rashomon expounds on the original story by injecting his own ponderings in the form of the woodcutter, the priest, and the commoner. Where I felt alone in my thoughts with the short story, Kurosawa's masterful auteur filmmaking acted as a friend sharing their thoughts on the subject. 
Included in his adaptation are the poetic visuals that continue to be a shining example of what cinematic language can achieve. The beauty of a film like Rashomon lives in how open to interpretation it really is, but the irony seems to be that in adapting In a Grove, the film is actually far less opaque than its source material. Which is fitting that a story about how the truth of an event can change from witness to witness would also change when Kurosawa retells it in his own way. Which is what makes this adaptation more about the experience of reading versus that of watching. It's about how it just feels different and about what moments stick out the most after you've seen the movie or read the story. Or, just like the bandit, the samurai, and his wife, what you remember to be true. Or what you dreamt. Ah, I said I won't apologize for that. Dude, it doesn't you know, land I think a big I screen actually that much. Would like an apology. We did this whole film for everything and you just fell asleep in the theater. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all for this episode of What's the Difference? Let us know how you remember Rashomon in the comments below. And for more of the most egregious, holier-than-thou, but at least self-aware film analysis around, be sure to subscribe to Cinefix and IGN Movies and TV. 